Irene Palmer was born on March 2nd, 1930 in Bridgeport, Connecticut, as we can see right here on her passport. Irene's mom was deeply religious, claiming that God spoke to her directly. As a girl, Irene had a series of visions just like her mother, but her father never believed any of this. He thought his wife was crazy and had her committed to a psychiatric hospital, forcing a tearful goodbye. I will always be with you. That was the last she ever saw of her mom, but her visions continued, which created issues with her father. After each vision, Irene would be left with the same thought in her head. Mary points the way. Word of her visions eventually reached the Catholic Church, and they sent a bishop to meet with the family and convince her father not to have her committed as well. The script for the nun offers a little more insight. Scripts are not usually considered canon, but this is one of those cases where it's relatively non-contradictory and even fits pretty well with the nun too, so I do want to talk about it briefly. Irene was investigated by the church to see if she had potentially been possessed, but it was ultimately decided that she was pure. The bishop suggested that she dedicate her life to the Lord, and when she did so, her vision stopped, so she planned to become a nun when she reached the proper age. And this process was sped up when Irene was sent away to live in Europe by her father. I was different. Sending me away was easier than trying to understand who I was. So she was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, has psychic visions, and became connected to the Catholic Church? If you follow the Conjuring franchise, this should all sound similar to another character, the paranormal investigator slash basically superhero Lorraine Warren. So what is the deal here? What is the true relationship between these two characters? To answer that question and to hear my full analysis of Sister Irene, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History. Yes, I have conjured up another one from The Conjuring Universe. As the highest grossing horror franchise of all time, The Conjuring films have done a great job of incorporating familiar elements to keep people interested in the spin-offs. The Annabelle doll was introduced in the first movie and became the centerpiece of several films of her own, but for the Nun spin-off series, the antagonist was not the only familiar element. In April 2017, it was announced that Thaisa Farmiga had been cast to play the lead role. Thaisa is the sister of Vera Farmiga, who plays Lorraine Warren in the mainline Conjuring film. So fans immediately began speculating that she could be related to Lorraine, or possibly even a younger version of her. Now last time I said the word titular in a video, I pronounced it wrong. I said titular, and everybody just eviscerated me in the comments, and I just wanted to defend myself because the word refers to the title of a work, so in my mind it makes sense that it would be titular, like title. But I admit I was wrong. I think next time I'll just just play it safe and say eponymous. Reason I bring this up is this Variety article claims that the younger Farmiga sister is playing the titular role in The Nun, and I think that's kind of arguable. Yes, she does play a nun, or at least she becomes a nun, but when I hear the title The Nun, I'm not thinking about her, I'm thinking about the nun demon Valak. I don't think anyone would go to see a nun movie if Valak was not in it, but they would probably be just fine if they did one without Sister Irene. But that being said, I would prefer to see more of this character, not less. It would be fun to see her go up against another villain in a different spin-off series at some point, because her backstory is mostly left as a mystery, other than a few clues here and there. So, to begin unraveling them, let's take it back to the unexpected guest who changed the course of her life. As an adult, Sister Irene works at St. Vincent Hospital in London, England. She still plans on becoming a nun, but hasn't taken her vows yet, making her a novitiate, something that everyone likes to point out constantly. You still haven't taken your temporary vows? You haven't taken your vows yet. You haven't taken your votes yet. Now you know how I feel every time someone asks me to make a Nun 2 video. I'm literally doing it. Different cultures handle it differently, but there are basically three steps to becoming a Nun. First, there's discernment. That's where you're considered a sister or a novitiate, but not yet a Nun. Once a sister takes her temporary vows, she becomes a Nun, and this kind of allows her to test the lifestyle. And if she's successful, she may make her perpetual vow, signifying lifelong commitment. In 1952, she's a natural history teacher for a group of kids who are maybe in fourth grade. I have survived many terrifying encounters, but nothing could have ever prepared me for this. My only hope now was that the beast could not smell me. But then, the wind changed, and... <laughs> This may just be a fictional story that she's telling to these kids to entertain them, but it could be a personal story about her experiences growing up with supernatural visions. It's possible that she's already taken on an entity in her past. If she grew up alongside Lorraine Warren, then I would say it's very likely, since we know Lorraine had visions from a young age as well. You know, when I was about your age, um, I was visiting my mom at a hospital. 
and I saw an angel standing next to a little boy's bed. He was just gently touching his cheek and then it stopped. By the way, if Irene and Lorraine grew up together, which they most likely did given that Lorraine was born in 1927 and Irene was born in 1930, then they're most likely cousins. We know that they aren't sisters because Lorraine's mom is still around in old age, but Irene's is not. Her dedication to religion made her believe that anything could be a sign from God, such as her brushing red paint onto this girl's nose. We'll come back to that. She's visited by a representative of the Vatican, which is basically like the HQ of the Catholic Church. His name is Father Burke, and she learned that she's been assigned to assist him on an investigation of an unusual phenomenon in Beertown, Romania, due to her familiarity with the territory. Romania. I've never been in that part of the world. Perhaps she's been chosen not because she is geographically familiar, but rather because she's familiar with the territory of supernatural encounters, maybe even involving evil entities. This begs the question, why would they choose her over Lorraine? After all, this was the same year Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research, at least in real life. It seems Irene was chosen because of the nature of the mission. Father Burke was to bring her to the Abbey of St. Carta to determine if the grounds were still holy. Since it is a cloistered convent and your access will be limited. This basically means that they're giving him a guide because the church is cut off from the outside world. Given that she's a nun in training, she would be allowed to explore the inside more than a normal civilian like Lorraine. But after arriving in Romania, things would prove more difficult than anticipated. Their first stop in Romania is to visit Maurice Theriault, commonly known as Frenchie. He's immediately flirting with her until learning that she's a prospective nun. However, she still charms him enough to convince him to take them up to the Abbey. With all due respect, Father, Please. I... Please. Frenchie. That was not that difficult. Don't you have anything better to do than simp? Once reaching the edge of the grounds, their horse refuses to continue and they have to go by foot. This is just like the dog in The Conjuring who refused to enter the house haunted by the witch Bathsheba. They learn that the locals spit on the ground whenever the topic of the abbey is brought up and the cross is lining the perimeter, maybe keeping the evil locked in. They visit the ice house to check on the body of the nun who killed herself, Sister Victoria, and she's strangely been moved into an upright position. Burke discovers a key clenched in her hands and they decide to give her a proper burial outside. Sister Irene begins to notice a number of strange things. The blood at the site of Victoria's death is still fresh, and upon entering the abbey, she senses something behind her without looking. This appears to be the Reverend Mother, or essentially the head nun, but what they don't know is that this is actually Valak, the Defiler, an ancient demon who is responsible for the evil plaguing the Abbey. Quick horror history lesson for those who haven't seen my Valak episode. This creature escaped from hell and killed off each of the nuns in the Abbey. Their spirits continue to inhabit the place as ghosts, but the Reverend Mother's ghost is under Valak's control, much like how Bill Wilkins' ghost was controlled in The Conjuring 2. They're asked to come back in the morning, since the sisters take a vow of silence after sunset. I bet my neighbors wish I would take a vow of silence after sunset, but hey, it's the best time to record videos. But Sister Irene and Father Burke nearly don't make it to sunrise. Burke gets trapped in a coffin by Valak, and Irene is woken up by a breeze in the middle of her sleep. If her visions are believed to be messages sent to her by God, I don't think it's crazy to assume that this was God waking her up so that she could save her comrade, and stand a chance to defeat Valak later on. She comes upon some kind of midnight ritual in a chapel, where Valak appears to her as a shadow. But after, she realizes the ritual was all an apparition, and the demonic entity makes itself known in a bold way. The fact that Sister Irene sees Valak in its nun form in the mirror has to be symbolic of the choice that lies ahead of her. She's considering becoming a nun herself, but struggles to make the commitment to take her vows. It's almost as if Valak in the mirror represents her fears about her potential future, a theme that would come up throughout her story. She's also not the only one to encounter Valak in this way. This is another connection Sister Irene shares with Lorraine. Also, in the nearby town, they have a tradition to cover their mirrors whenever someone dies. So the deceased doesn't see their reflection. This is likely why Valak destroyed the mirror, so that Sister Irene can never find out that all of the nuns are already dead. After fleeing the chapel, she hears a bell ringing and instantly knows that Father Burke is in trouble. The grave sites around the perimeter contain what are known as safety coffins. The bell system was developed in 1892, with strings connecting the occupant's head, hands, and feet to a bell on the outside. This way, the cemetery watchman would be alerted if they accidentally buried one alive. If you're wondering if this is where the phrase saved by the bell comes from, it's not, according to this article from Ripley's Believe It or Not. But apparently, the phrase doesn't come from school either, it comes from boxing. And as someone who shares a name with the main character from a cultural touchstone sitcom called Saved by the Bell, you would think I would know that. Anyway, Sister Irene had learned about the safety coffins earlier that day and somehow knew that the father was in trouble when she heard one ringing. As she got close, Valak chimed all of the bells in order to confuse her, and we see her close her eyes and envision which distress call is the real deal. 
The next day, he sends Irene away with the key acquired from Sister Victoria's cold, dead fingers. I bet he tells that story, like, seriously whenever he gets the chance. And then, I pried the key from her cold, dead hands. Waiter, one more round, please. Sister Irene finds the main sanctuary and comes across Sister Oana, who informs her that the nuns are taking prayer shifts to maintain a constant state of prayer. Sister Victoria's death was a terrible tragedy for the convent, but we still feel her presence. She was the most devoted out of any of us. Has anyone else noticed that we are literally getting shamalonged right now? They don't know they're dead. Personally, I am never one to complain about getting shamalonged or weezered or rickrolled or even Josh Hutcherson whistle edited. They also discuss an imposter nun, which Sister Oana describes as something unholy, perhaps the evil re-emerging after being sealed for so many years. Another sister, Sister Abigail, instructs Sister Oana to resume her prayers and tells Irene that she should not be here since she's not taken her vows yet. We f***ing get it. However, she's told that she has to stay the night because the gates have once again closed until morning. My theory about the mirrors being connected to Irene's fear of becoming a nun is supported here, because the room that she stays in contains a mirror and she receives another vision in her dream, where Mary points the way echoes through her head, and she envisions Valak, the suicide of Sister Victoria, and a girl covered in blood. When she awakens, a door opens, and she's beckoned to explore by a spectral voice, leading to the discovery of an underground passage marked by the words finit hic deo, Latin for God ends here. It opens to reveal the bane of all things holy, Valak. She finds herself suddenly in a windstorm as she tries to escape, but the evil nun just grins menacingly at her. It comes to a halt as she's slammed into the door, but then this happens. What little light there is in the corridor is smothered away, and she's pulled into a hiding spot by Sister Oana. When the threat passes, she's instructed to get her things and meet in the chapel so they can pray their way through the night. But after arriving there, Sister Irene makes a gruesome discovery. In the main sanctuary, Irene finds a nun praying fervently next to a body under a sheet, which turns out to be Sister Oana. A whole flock of nuns storms in. I'm pretty sure I established in a previous video at some point that a group of nuns traveling together like this should be referred to as a flock, and I'm sticking with it. They lock the place up, and Sister Ruth urges Irene to pray with them. And whatever happens, whatever you may see or hear, keep your eyes forward and don't stop praying. Sister Irene hyperventilates, but complies. Suddenly, a blast aerates all of the other nuns away from her. And she does exactly what Sister Ruth told her not to do. She diverts her eyes and her prayer is interrupted. This whole scene is another test of her commitment to religion on her journey to becoming a nun. By looking away, she's distracted by outside elements. But then she refocuses her attention and continues her prayer. Her garb is then ripped open from behind, but this is not Frenchy choosing an inopportune time to make his move. It is instead an invisible force that scratches a pentagram into her back. This is another test of her dedication. She must tune out the pain and continue her prayer. It's like when you're trying to get work done, but then you see the notification that CZ's world just uploaded and you have to resist the temptation to watch the video. Except in that scenario, the correct answer is to watch the video or at least put it on in the background. But my point is that her restraint was being tested. She only stops when she hears Father Burke and Frenchie trying to get in, and one of the other nuns gives her a nod of approval. After letting them in, she lets them know that they've all been praying to hold back the evil. But when she turns back, all of the others are gone. And this is what makes her realize that the nuns that she's been seeing up until this point were just part of her visions, or rather, spirits of the deceased nuns that once inhabited the abbey. In other words, there was nobody left when they arrived. The place is filled with ghosts, and apparently reanimated corpses. He instructs her to get some holy water from his bag and throw it on the evil nun. And I love in all these movies whenever they try to make these priests like these badass action heroes and they just have their satchels packed with holy water so they can whip it out like a gun. And it works. It works every time. He douses a cross in holy water and uses it to drive the demonic force out of the nun's body, which goes up in flames when the entity can no longer endure the divinity bearing down on it. Frenchie is about ready to GTFO, but Sister Irene bravely insists that they cannot leave without first sealing the gateway to contain the evil. She's come a long way. At first, she had no idea what her purpose was on this mission, but now she's the one leading the charge into the underground passages to search for the blood of Christ that will supposedly send the Crooked Nose Conventual back to where it came from. And having found her purpose, she's ready to make a commitment that she wasn't sure about before. I'd like to take my vows. She does this because she's discovered that her visions are a miracle of God. Either that or she's just sick of everybody asking her about it. It's kind of an L for Frenchie, that. Uh, that sister is a noble act. It's a shame, but... Oh, Frenchie. You'll find someone. 
briefly, then you'll die. Imagine if you were crushing on a girl and then she became a nun and swore herself to celibacy. That's kind of like, I don't know, I think I'd be kind of salty. Father Burke helps her make what I believe are her temporary vows. And she's T-posing face down on the ground, so that's kind of funny. After officially becoming a nun, she feels she's ready to face down the demon posing as a nun, no longer willing to be taunted by the form that she felt mocked by. In the corridors under the abbey, a beam of light shines down on the finger of this Virgin Mary statue, connecting to the phrase associated with her visions since childhood, Mary points the way, and further making her believe that her visions came from God. They follow the beam to a secret keyhole in the wall and unlock it using the key recovered from Sister Victoria to find the glass orb containing the blood of Christ. And Father Burke tells her that only a true bride of Christ can wield it. So I guess it's a good thing she did her vows. With the ultimate weapon in hand, they proceed past the cellar door for the first time into the area where evil reigns supreme. They split up. You know, the thing you're definitely supposed to do in a horror movie, and Irene is stalked by a faceless nun as she hears the whispers of the spirits of the nuns who had assisted her. But before she can do anything, she's chokeslammed by Valak and runs to a seemingly unused storage room for safety. Once again, there's a mirror, and for the third time now, it would be connected to Valak. She's encircled by five candles, which light themselves, and she realizes that she's standing in a pentagram. But as she runs for the exit, she's stopped in her tracks by an army of robed figures, who abduct her and bag her head, forcing her to join their ranks. Frenchy eventually finds her, but when he uncovers her head, she's been possessed by Valak, and she aerates him into a pillar, which he's pinned against. This is the next logical step in the mirror metaphor. Valak had used mirrors to make Irene fear her future as a nun, and now that she's realized that life by becoming one, Valak would literally possess her. It's bringing those fears to fruition. The possessed Irene hurls targeted insults about Frenchie being the village idiot. It's a trope that we've seen a lot in the exorcism genre, going back to the exorcist. However, he's able to use the vial hanging from her neck to smear the blood of Christ on her face, calling back to the beginning of the adventure when she smeared the paint on the girl's nose. This has an immediate and powerful effect, exorcising the demon from her body. And it's honestly just nice to see an exorcism scene in this franchise that doesn't involve throwing up that black substance. She's knocked aside as Valak deviously grabs Frenchie by the throat and flies flashes a disgusting smile in her direction. She tries to bum rush the evil entity, but she's aerated completely out of the room into a pool of water that's forming by flooding from overhead. It's possible that this moment is supposed to represent a symbolic baptism. A baptism is a Christian practice of submerging a person in water to cleanse or purify them as an initiation to joining the religion. This is more of a symbolic baptism than the literal one. Being baptized is a requirement for being a Catholic nun, so it's likely that Sister Irene already went through the baptism ceremony when she was young. But now that she's taken her vows and joined the Sisterhood of Nuns, she's starting a new chapter in her life. On the website TV Tropes, a symbolic baptism is defined as a sign of character development where swimming or watery immersion marks a major turning point in the character's life. Most commonly, it marks the point where the character begins to let go of the past or is initiated into a new phase of their life. So this fits Sister Irene pretty well. She loses grasp of the Holy Grail, but when she goes to reach for it, she notices Valak rising up from below the surface. <laughs> attacks and holds down Sister Irene under the water. Even Father Burke's prayers do little to slow it down. However, he does provide just enough of a distraction for Irene to bring the grail to her mouth under the surface. With that, Valak believes that it's won and lifts her up to eye level, but realizes the contents of the glass case have been removed. And Irene outsmarts her hellish counterpart with where she's hidden the goods. For years, the people in town have spit on the ground after any mention of the evil as ancient superstition, and now Irene is using the same tactic to hopefully finish it off for good. And this has a devastating effect, as Valak appears to be sucked down into a vortex and back where it came from. Before leaving, she gives a proper blessing to the nuns of St. Carta. I thought this ground wasn't holy anymore. It is now. And before leaving Romania, she sees off Frenchie at the train station and learns that he's planning on going to Hungary, then traveling the world. At some point after this, she must have gone back to the Vatican with Father Burke and met Cardinal Conroy, who was obviously impressed enough by her work to call upon her again in the future. The story of what happened in Romania kind of becomes an urban legend among the other sisters and nuns. What happened to the nun? Well, no one really knows. They say the experience was too much for her. Some say that she went mad. It seems like it would be difficult for gossip to spread, considering that cloistered nuns generally do not travel. However, other nuns and sisters do apparently travel a lot, primarily for missionary work, where they try to recruit people in other countries to their religion. They would not be the only ones bothering people from other countries. After lying dormant inside a Frenchie for four years, Valak would re-emerge in 1955 and 1956 and take four victims across Europe, one of which was a priest named Father Noiré who was immolated at his church in Tarascon, France. Because of course the French priest would be named after wine. 
That night, Irene wakes up in the middle of the night in a manner very similar to when the breeze woke her up at St. Carta's, right down to the way that the curtains blow in the breeze. Given my earlier analysis, I would interpret this as a divine call to action. And in fact, this is another dream, a vision of Maurice possessed by Valak and asking to be saved. The next day, she is visited by Cardinal Conroy. She doesn't look thrilled to see him, which is kind of understandable considering this dude only shows up to deliver bad news. There has been an incident. See, I told you, he doesn't even make any small talk first. I'm the exact same way. She's given the lowdown on the four gruesome deaths moving west across Europe, which they suspect to be the work of the demon that she thought she had sealed away four years prior with the help of Father Burke. Speaking of whom? Father Burke is dead. See, this guy never has any good news. She doesn't want to go, but they basically strong arm her. Luckily, her friend Sister Deborah tags along to look after her, so she's not completely solo as she begins her search at the site of the last known incident, Tarascon, France. Like the Abbey in Romania, there's a belief that this church is cursed following Valak's appearance. As she looks around the place, she's able to see visions of the past, falling ash, the burnt up husk of Father Noir Ray, and the boy who inherited his rosary. They're taken to see Father Noir Ray's room, and they come across a picture of St. Luke. Lucy, patron saint of the blind. Like much of the lore in the controverse, Saint Lucy is based on a real person, a saint from Italy in the 200s who devoted herself to Christianity. There are a number of myths and stories about the cause of her blindness. Some versions say that she gouged out her own eyes when a potential lover became infatuated with them in order to prove her dedication to religion and virginity. Another take on the matter tells of how she was captured by the Roman Emperor Diocletian and her eyes were gouged out prior to her execution. That seems to be closer to the version of the tale that appears in the controverse. She was murdered by pagans. They lit her on fire, but she wouldn't burn. Before killing her, they gouged out her eyes. Very metal. Irene learns that Frenchie had worked at this very church as a handyman until Father Noiré was killed, and comes to the realization pretty quickly that he must have been the vessel that smuggled Valak out of the abbey, and the reason that these tragedies are seemingly spreading across the continent. While checking in at the Hotel Tarascon, Irene's sixth sense is on high alert, and she's led out into the street where she sees the altar boy, Jacques, among a group of kids playing European football. Jacques was the one whose father was killed by Valak. In pursuit of answers, she finds herself at a newsstand, where the wind blows the pages of each magazine open to the right page to to collectively form the haunting image of Valak, right next to this picture of Harambe. When she gets close to it, Valak appears in a flash and grabs her throat, and in this instant she receives a vision of a burning ritual in a forest, where a man in a red cloak stabs a nun in the face as she holds some kind of artifact. He stabs her twice, then we see a divine light coming from her eyes, leading me to believe that this is a representation of Saint Lucy, patron saint of the blind. Irene passes out in the streets, not waking up until the next morning. I'm not sure if the doctor was using a figure of speech or if Irene's survival from this incident was not guaranteed. There she is, back from the dead. I kind of wish we could see what happened in between. It seems like she was out for like eight hours at least. Was the doctor just prodding her and shining lights in her eyes all night until she woke up? And then he just leaves without getting paid? Are we sure this dude is a real doctor? What happened last night? Nah, that's what she should be asking you. Anyway, Irene concludes that Valak is using Frenchie to get at this relic that she saw in her vision. While she was unconscious, Jacques visited Sister Deborah and dropped off his father's rosary, which is basically this necklace with a cross, which is often seen being used to fend off demons, and it also contains this symbol. The symbol, it, it seems so familiar, but, but I can't place it. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and just assume that she's still a little foggy since she just woke up, but it's clearly the symbol from the artifact in her vision, which doesn't seem like it was that long ago. The symbol also matches a piece of jewelry seen in the crime scene photos of the other Valak victims provided by Cardinal Bad News Conroy. They hurry to Palais du Pop, the Catholic archives, to try to learn what they can about the symbol, but they would also receive a tip that would have rippling ramifications. The librarian at the Catholic Archives is able to identify the symbol they brought in as the family crest of St. Lucy. The archivist thinks that each of the demon's victims are descendants of St. Lucy, and that Valak is hunting them down in search of the eyes, a sacred relic in Lucy's family that holds spiritual power, much like the blood of Christ. According to his records, he thinks they can find the eyes buried at the monastery of Jean-Paul Rodar, which is now a boarding school. They rush over there, hoping to arrive before the relic falls into the wrong hands, and the first person she encounters is none other than her old guide, Frenchie. But the reunion is soured by Irene's accusation that the evil is living inside of him. Get away from them! What? We need to go now! It's you! It's inside of you! This causes the dormant unholiness to take over his body and deliver a chilling greeting. Hello, sister. When she tries to follow him, he right hooks her into a window, but she comes back with the rosary and demands the demon to leave his body. Sister Deborah chips in with the Bellinger bash, and they chain up the unconscious Maurice in the hallway. He's sick. We're going to help him, but we need your help. 
Sister Irene has some serious Universal Studios ride pre-show energy right here. Like how they always try to make the rider feel like they're a part of the story, and then the help that we give is literally just being along for the ride. But then when you get back to the station, everybody claps for you like you've accomplished something. They realize that Frenchie was headed toward the old haunted chapel, and the young boarding student, Sophie, fills them in on the lore. That the goat on the stained glass window is a devil whose eyes will glow red when the sun hits it at the right angle. They're able to recreate this with the flashlight and find the endpoint of the red beam, which must be pointing out where the eyes of St. Lucy are buried. If you're getting a little bit of deja vu, it's probably because this is the exact same puzzle as the one that Irene solved back at the Abbey of St. Carta to find the blood of Christ. But this time, instead of being directed by a supposedly divine figure, she's following the clues of a supposedly demonic one. Is this representative of the potential danger that lies in trying to use the eyes? A sign that this time they're playing with a weapon that they may not be able to control? Maybe. The goat demon disappears from the stained glass and appears in the girls' sleeping quarters on the other side of the school, causing mayhem for them to tend to. But they soon discover the reason this previously inanimate object has come to life. Frenchie has escaped from his chains under Valak's control, and he air yeats Sophie's mom out of the way, en route to tackling Sister Irene, and forcing a fumble which is recovered and advanced by Sophie. This does draw Frenchie Valak's attention away, but Sister Irene is left in pretty bad shape. There may be some symbolism here pertaining to Irene's own relationship with her father. There's no mention of him being physically abusive towards her, but Irene says that she was sent away by him because that was easier than trying to understand her. Clearly, it's a strained relationship. Frenchie has been trying to take on a fatherly role himself lately, doing his best to serve as a role model for Sophie before Sister Irene showed up. So his attack on Sister Irene was likely received as a very personal jab, given her problems with her own father. It wouldn't be that different from when Valak temporarily possessed Sister Irene in 1952 and started hurling targeted insults about Frenchie being the village idiot. The extremely helpful archive librarian guy even hinted that the demon of St. Carta would choose a form to prey on her fears. And the fears of those around you. You must be prepared to stop it at all costs. That guy was such a king, by the way. He basically solved the whole mystery for them, told them exactly where to go, and what they would be up against. And his name isn't even mentioned outside of the credits. Let's give it up for Father Ridley, the true hero of the story. Anyway, Irene is only able to track down where Sophie and Frenchie Valak ran off to after seeing this tower start to crumble under the power of St. Lucy's eyes, which she uses to ward off the demon moments before retrieving the blessed artifact from Sophie. Her will is tested when Frenchie, what appears to be the real Frenchie, gets through and begs for his life. But she knows she must not hold back in order to prevent anyone else from becoming a victim. Plus, that's what Father Ridley told her, and he's basically a god among men at this point. Just when it seems he's finished, Frenchie Valak springs back to life and grabs the eyes from her, and seems to absorb them? And Valak rises up, in nun form behind him, now taking on an enormous stature. She tries using the rosary, but that didn't work in 1952, so why would it work now? Valak responds by shooting this chain at Sister Deborah, and Irene is levitated into the air in a crucifixion pose and lit on fire. Valak seems to be using the power of the eyes to deal Irene the same fate that St. Lucy once suffered. But then, Irene experiences a quick flash of images, so let's break them down. First, she hears her mother's words, I will always be with you. Then, she sees her mother looking at her, followed by two images of the burning St. Lucy at the hands of the pagans. Then, the picture of St. Lucy from Father Noiré's church. She also sees Valak standing in Lorraine Warren's home in 1977, and intercut with more flashes of her mom, an image of Lorraine Warren opening her eyes after seeing Valak for the first time, which also doesn't happen until 1977. Not the first example of her having future sight, but maybe the first time that she gets a glance into someone else's future. After a few more images, Images of the attempted burning of St. Lucy, her own flame goes out and she falls to the ground. Like St. Lucy, the pagan was unable to burn her. And I'm considering Valak to represent the pagan in this instance because Valak's lore comes from a grimoire or spellbook called Ars Goetia, part of a series of demon summoning guidebooks called the Lesser Key of Solomon. So the summoning of Valak is not connected to any major religion, thus making it a pagan mythological entity. So what do all of these images mean? Well, remember back at the beginning when I suggested that Irene and Lorraine probably have some blood relation due to the actresses that portray them, Vera and Thaisa Farmiga being sisters? Well, there's another pair of characters whose actresses share common blood. St. Lucy and Irene's mom are both played by Kate Colebrook, which to me suggests that these characters are supposed to be related as well meaning that Irene and Lorraine are both part of the bloodline of St. Lucy, which means that the images that flash through Irene's head have one thing in common. They're all blood relatives. When Irene's mom says, I will always be with you, she's not just talking about her memory. She's referring to the supernatural power of the St. Lucy bloodline. The power that, when combined with the eyes of St. Lucy, seems to protect her from the threat of burnination. Through the fire and the flames, Sister Irene carries on. It's further suggested shortly after, when Irene recalls Father Ridley's quip about the Lucy family. 
When Lucy was murdered, her family escaped. They were hunted, scattered across the globe. Perhaps the eyes of St. Lucy are not only an artifact, but also a generational gift, allowing those in her bloodline to have psychic visions? It would certainly seem plausible, because Lorraine has the same gift, and in The Conjuring 2 and Annabelle Comes Home, it's clear that she's passed it down to her daughter, Judy Warren. Mom, who's that? But the battle isn't over yet. Sister Deborah joins Sister Irene in prayer, and in probably the most French thing that could have possibly happened, barrels of red wine burst open and wash Valak away, causing the infernal enemy to somehow dry up and combust into an epic inferno. Frenchy is temporarily able to regain control of his body, but the evil would continue to lie dormant inside of him. But for the time being, it seemed that Sister Irene had paid back a favor by saving his life four years after he had done the same for her. The two would see each other off for presumably the final time, this time with just a nod, as Frenchy moves on with his new found family. Yeah, and that's just it. Sister Irene's story arc is not a typical final girl archetype of a girl coming out of her shell to kill the villain or overcoming her fear to escape her stalker. In true Conjuring fashion, it's more of a spiritual journey. She's been chosen by a higher power, whether that be God or Cardinal Bad News Conroy, and she's forced to demonstrate her faith by taking her vows and believing in her vision. My problem is that her entire character arc is completed in The Nun 1, and character-wise, nothing really happens with her in The Nun 2. You could say that I was none too pleased with the sequel. The extremely helpful librarian Father Ridley does more than she does in that movie. He literally does all the work for her. He solves the mystery of the Lucy family crest for her, he explains all the lore to them, then when she wants to find the eyes, he's like, I already found them, and tells her exactly where to go. It's so bizarre. Irene is basically only relevant in The Nun 2 because she was born with St. Lucy's blood. It's not something that she earned or struggled for, so it feels cheap when that ends up being what helps her overcome Valak. This is what I call a chosen one story. There are two types of chosen one stories, the good kind and the bad kind. In the good kind, the hero is destined to become the only one who can defeat the villain, but success is not guaranteed. For example, in Harry Potter, which also takes place in a European boarding school, a prophecy seems to point to Harry being the only one with the power to defeat the Dark Lord, but he still has to mature and form relationships and overcome adversity by embracing the power of love along the way. His character arc ultimately puts him in a position where he could be the victor. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess has a protagonist referred to as the hero chosen by the gods, but that doesn't make him immune to death. He has to build trust with his companion, Midna, and learn ancient skills along the way in order to even have a chance. Sister Irene seems to just be invincible against fire because she was born that way. She didn't really earn it. She's more like Rey from the Star Wars sequel trilogy. She's essentially able to win very early on because of who she is. Again, this is more of a problem with the second Nun movie than the first. If you want to see an example of how this could have been done a little better, watch Insidious The Last Key. In that movie, Elise Rainier is a psychic ghost and demon hunter, just like Sister Irene, who had almost the exact same problem, with her dad not believing or being afraid of her psychic abilities and treating her poorly because of it. Elise lives her life hunting some of the world's scariest demons, but none of that compares to her personal demons with her father. In the end, the antagonist, Keyface, uses her father's ghost to confront her, and she must overcome the familial issues in order to hunt down her real enemy. Valak has the ability to take on any form, which is why it chooses the nun form to mock the sisters at the Abbey of St. Carta in Nun 1. So it would have made sense for one of the alternate forms to resemble Sister Irene's personal demon in her relationship with her father in the second movie. You know, instead of this random goat from the stained glass window. If you want to see my full analysis of Keyface, by the way, that link will be in the description. But to get a proper grasp on how everything connects in the Conjuring universe, you'll want to have your pointer possess that playlist on the left. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.